Go to Colossians chapter 1 with me, if you would, please. Colossians chapter 1. I've been in Colossians chapter 1 many times over the years we've been together, and, and this is one of my favorite chapters of the New Testament especially. There's so much packed into it, don't have time to unpack it all, but rather as we move through some verses of it, I'm going to focus on one particular truth, but I want to bring it right up into our day. Drop it right into your laps and let you experience, hear, feel through the Holy Spirit, through the power of his word. Listen to me now and see with your eyes the truth of this word that was written 2,000 years ago. And I pray that you'll leave here invigorated by what you hear and by what you see. Let's set the base, the foundation, the backbone for what we're going to be exploring this morning. Colossians chapter 1. We'll start with verse 15, a passage that you've heard so many times before. The context is this. Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. This book would eventually be um, passed around to all of the churches and uh, circulated through and among them eventually canonized as understanding to be spirit-led and spirit-breathed scripture. This passage we're going to read is the Apostle Paul just breaking out into deep theological truth, agreeing with Genesis 1, John chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, all of them discussing how God created and how God in the flesh, in Jesus Christ, the creator of all. And so he's just going into a, a song of praise, a, a word of praise. As he's getting ready to get into more of the meat of his instructions to the church at Colossae. But listen to verse 15. He, that is Jesus Christ, that's who he's been talking about. Yeshua HaMashiach. He is the image of the invisible God. That, that, that word, image of the invisible God, that's a poetic and a beautiful way of saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But you weren't there and you didn't see it. And you cannot see God as he really is. So therefore that word put on flesh and dwelt among us. And then we saw the glory of the Father filled with grace and truth. I submit to you, and the Bible does too, that we still haven't seen him in all of his glory. Oh, somebody might think, Carl, you just blaspheme. You said Jesus wasn't all of his glory. He was, but he was all of humanity as well. He was the image of the God whom we can't see so that we can know that God, our creator, personally. And so that he could provide the way, the sacrifice, the way back to him, our creator. There's a lot packed in those few words, and I just did a poor job of describing it, but he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, because by him, who? Jesus, God, who became flesh, by him, all things were created. How many is all? Things in heaven, things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Well, I've preached on this a lot over the years. I've written books wherein I've included many chapters about the great truths that are there especially all things holding together in Jesus Christ. That's another sermon. I've preached it several times from this pulpit. It is 
not my preaching, but the truth is astounding. It it's, it's, it's goes as deep as you want to go. It'll blow your mind when you know the science behind it, as well as just the daily truth behind it. But here's what I want to focus on this morning. He's the creator of all things. Things visible. We look outside the Grand Canyon. He created that. The mountains of the world. He created them. The oceans of the world. He created them. The fish in the sea. He created them. The birds in the sky. He created them. The mammals that move along the ground. He created them. The eight billion people on the earth now and those that came before and those that will come after. He created them. The grass, the trees, the flowers. He created them. The sun, the moon, the stars. He created them. He created all things. The things that we can see. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Don't ever hesitate during all of this this morning to praise him. He, everything we can see, but also things we cannot see. I've preached and written a lot about the multiple dimensions of reality that are all around us. We've talked about CERN and the modern scientific understanding of quantum mechanics and that even physicists understand that there are multiple dimensions of physical reality. We have evidence and proof, physical, if you will, proof, scientific proof. We just don't understand the depths of it. But from the pages of Genesis 1, these truths have been spoken of for thousands of years. All the way through the Bible to the book of Revelation, we read different dimensions of physical reality Paul puts it in the plainest words in Ephesians 6 when he said, look, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the powers and the rulers of the unseen realms. That, there, there's a biblical word for dimensions of reality that are unseen to us. Wow. There are a lot of things that are unseen to us. And may I say this? I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. We don't know what we don't know. You're going to hear this out of the mouths of scientists this morning. You're going to see it. This morning I have four video clips I'm going to use and incorporate in everything that I'm going to teach and preach. I promise you, you're going to want some paper and pencil to take some notes. And here's how I know, because some of you won't do it, and you'll come up to me after and say, Carl, tell me where that was again. I'm going to say, nope. I told you. You're going to need paper and pencil. <laughs> this is, Okay. I also want to tell you that I'm going to be speaking of a lot of scientific things and you're in some of these videos you're going to hear scientific language and names of various scientific things. Don't, don't get caught up in that if you don't have that kind of a mind. And I'm not talking down to anybody. I do have a scientific my, uh, a mind that's interested in scientific things, but I do not claim to be a physicist or a chemist. A chemist, a chemist, can't even say the word. A chemist, if you can't say it, you're not that. I don't claim that. At a novice level, I can understand the, the, the foundational principles, though. And, and so some are like me. Some are way above me in all of this. And, and, and some just don't have any interest for knowing all that stuff. But, but please hear me. Pay attention to what you're going to hear and see, and I'll introduce it and then preach at the end and all of that. But you're, you're going to be interested in this. There's no way. If you're human and you're breathing, you're going to be interested in this. Jesus Christ, the creator of all things. How many is all? All. Things visible and things invisible. And we don't know what we don't know. We still don't know what we don't know. The greatest minds in the world still are baffled by some of the teeniest things. First chapter of Corinthians, I'm paraphrasing, but it says something similar to that. It's the small things of the world that God uses to confound the wisdom of the wise. Wisdom in quotes. The small things, the invisible things, the teeny things like atoms, a strand of DNA. I mean, I could go on and all the molecular makeup of our body. The quantum levels of atomic structure, the small things that we can't even see. twist the minds of the smartest among us who think they're so wise until we step into another realm of deeper technology and the ability to see and experience things even deeper than ever before and then our mind is blown again. God uses the smallest, even invisible things 
to confound those who say, we're so wise, we've got all the answers to everything. There was an accidental explosion, a chemical sludge pond, and men came from monkeys, and that settled science. <laughs> they wonder why we laugh at them. <clears throat> Whether things visible or invisible. You see, the bottom line is, is if you deny the existence of God and the creation brought about through the word of God and the word becoming flesh, Jesus Christ, and what he did on Calvary's cross, you deny all of that and you try to explain what you see and now what we're seeing that we didn't used to be able to see, you sound dumber and dumber. If you just completely leave out of the equation intelligent design, you, just, you sound dumber and dumber the more you speak. You're going to see that this morning. Let me just set some background. Now, hang on. It's going to be a little bit of history, a little bit of science, a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of biology. The real experts, you're going to hear some of them. They speak at a layman's level. I love it, or else I couldn't understand it. That's why I thought you'd be interested. But there are some here that can speak at it at any level you want. I understand that. But what I really want is for at least the, our young people to know this, because they're being lied to every day. And when they see this and hear this this morning, I think they will be well equipped to withstand those lies. Oh, they might have to put the right answers on the test, but they will be well equipped to know the truth. Watch what I'm telling you now. Watch what I'm telling you. But also, I want everybody in here to be able to accurately handle the Word of God, because when we walk in Jesus Christ, when we abide in Him, then we are abiding in the truth, the Word of God says. And the truth sets us free. In the early 1600s, a guy that was playing with the design of eyeglasses put one lens over another just to see what would happen, and he realized that it magnified tremendously. In, in the early 1600s, 400 years ago, the rudimentary form of a microscope was invented. Huh. 200 years later, at about the time the Civil War was breaking out in the United States in the 1860s, over in Switzerland, a scientist using the most updated form of that ancient microscope, and in the 1860s we would say those were ancient microscopes too, but to him it was the most advanced technology he had. And he was examining a piece of human tissue and he was able to see that it wasn't just a blob of flesh, that there were cellular structures within that tissue. And within those cells, there was what would be termed as a nucleus, a center, another, like a cell within a cell. And in that nucleus, there were globules of, of chemical compound structures that seemed to be communicating somehow with that cell. What he didn't know was he had stumbled upon and was one of the very first to stumble upon the discovery of what we now call DNA. But he was right in a lot of his assumptions. That was in the 1860s. In the 1890s, over in Germany, the microscope was taking on even broader depths of uh, technological advancement. And he took closer and longer looks at all of that, off the work of that Swedish scientist, and discovered that there actually was a structure that surely did seem to be communicating. And of all things, he discovered that the structure, this, this took a long time, I'm really simplifying it, but was, was a literal structure. It was a thing. And it contained chemicals, 
nucleotides, if you will, base forms that there were four major ones that seemed to be doing the communicating, now represented by A, T, G, C. Those are the first letters of those chemical compounds. And so we know DNA now. We can say, what are the four bases of DNA? And most people that, you know, that if, if have studied this at all, from either from middle school on up, could be able to say A, T, C, G. And those represent. But that guy is the one that found that. And he is the one that coined the phrase deoxyribonucleic acid because of all the compounds that he was discovering that made the thing work. <laughs> DNA, ATCG, he isolated those things. That was in the 1890s. But in 1953, Francis Crick, scientist, chemist, microbiologist, from Great Britain, and his counterpart in the United States, James Watson, Dr. Watson, I presume, <laughs> 1953, they discovered that that nucleic acid, that DNA, had a double helix structure to it. It is like two staircases winding around each other, or these two fingers that I'm trying to hold up that probably those of you in the back can't see, but you know what a double helix is. And that <clears throat> when those strands were separated, they discovered that those four, I'm going to call them letters, but what they are is chemicals. The letters represent the chemicals. Those four letters were arranged upon the backbones, that double helix, in a code. The backbones are made up of phosphates and sugars. The letters, the chemicals they stand for, I'm going to quit saying that, but just every time I speak of the letters, you understand I'm talking about chemicals that begin with those letters. The ATGC, those bases were arranged along those backbones as a language as a code, and the code changed for each species and even among the species, which is what that code makes some of us male, some of us female, and it makes each of us individually unique, and no one except maybe a twin or something would, would share the same DNA that we have out of eight billion people because that code is speaking to our body telling our body how to form itself in every minute detail that makes me, me, and you, you. They discovered that in 1953, and it blew their minds. It blew the minds of the world. Probably one of the, if not the most important scientific discovery of all times. Now listen to me. That started with a guy putting two lenses together who was making glasses in the 1600s. Now, that's only been 400 years ago. Out of the six to 10,000 years of human history, we didn't know any of this stuff. Think of it. For all of those years, yet 2,000 years ago, the Bible's speaking about things that are unseen. And that's not the only place. It's in the book of Hebrews. It says, by faith, we believe that God created everything that is seen by things that are unseen. Now we know about atoms and quantum mechanics. And by gosh, the Bible was right. It's almost like God knows what he's talking about. It's almost like that. We come to Colossians. Now we're told that the word that became flesh is, of course, Jesus Christ, whom we saw the glory of God and through whom the whole creation was created. Everything we see and everything that we don't see. And until 1953, we didn't really have a clue what we were seeing it when we finally did start seeing it just 400 years ago. And I know some of you might be tempted to say, well, we understand it now. Just wait. <laughs> now, having said all of that, there's so much more. I, I, I mean, we could talk about DNA, but it's basically it's the building block of life. Every living thing on the planet begins with DNA, which we now know is a code book, let's call it. In fact, that's what the Human Genome Project basically called it, the book of life. 
the evolutionists hated that, and they try to tamper that down all over the internet, but that's what the Human Genome Project scientists called it. It's the book of life. Oh my gosh, there's a book of instructions, and it's creating life. Really? A globule of chemicals? Creating 7.9 million species of life? from grass to flowers to trees to microbes to monkeys to whales to humans to dogs to cats to birds to fish to f a globule of chemicals that you cannot see without a microscope that's a pretty smart globule right there You know how many cells are in your body, in the human body? 37 trillion cells. Inside the middle of each of those cells is our DNA and the chromosomes that the DNA constructs. You'll see this in a moment, which is the book of our lives. Why we're here, how we got here. And I submit to you, and who put us here? You're going to see all this in a moment, but things even far more amazing than that. But first, we're going to hear from a couple of scientists. These four little video clips I pulled from a longer video clip, and it's all done legally, and we've given all the reference to whoever it goes to and everything, so we can show it here for you today. Both of these guys are PhDs. One of them's a PhD in microbiology. The other is a PhD in chemistry. Both of them are teachers at universities, et cetera, et cetera, and accomplished in their fields. Their names are in these little short clips. They both speak at, at, at layman's level. In fact, one of the um, clips that I've taken several of the videos from, and each video is, I don't know, they average four, four minutes a, a piece or less. So they're not, they're not long, but boy, they say a lot. Forget all the scientific, you know, names and things. We're not here in a science class to memorize this. There will be no test afterwards. But listen to what they're saying. And, of course, I'll preach it and teach it as we move through. But with all of this in mind, that all of this is new to humanity. The Human Genome Project. So after 1953, when then the double helix was understood, and the coding was understood, and the fact that it was communicating was understood, and the fact that that's what came up with the 3.79 or 7 million different species. And by the way, those are species. So the species dog, how many subsets are under them? You know, you got poodles and chihuahuas and German shepherds and rockweilers and wolves and coyotes and foxes and it goes on and on and on. 3.7 million species. And then everything else that's underneath it. From a little nucleotide, acidic, protein, creating globule called deoxyribonucleic acid a double helix with four chemicals represented by ATCG that develops a language of its own. We have 26 letters in our alphabet. From that, we can make millions of words. From that, all the books of the world are written, poetry. I mean, we've gone from, you know, sitting around fires at night and riding horses to going to the moon and into deep space and internets and up and down interstate highways and on and on. Why? Because, because we've got letters now and we can form words which form ideas and thoughts which we can pass on to generation to generation. 26 letters, look what we've accomplished. I want to show you what God has accomplished with four. And you're going to hear the reasons why. Unlimited numbers excuse me, of, of words. And from those words come sentences. And from those sentences come instructions. And from those instructions come everything you see. It is the literal word that has become flesh. Everything that is seen and everything that is unseen was created by him and for him, and in him all things hold together. 
can we get the lights turned down and roll that first clip? The first clip's about, I don't know, three or four minutes. Don't worry about how long. They're, none of them are over, much over that. Um, let's roll that first clip, and we'll go from there. Can we get the lights down? Yeah, thank you. for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. We've been talking about DNA. And um, we know that DNA is, is, is a chemical. chemical. But I, I guess, guess the, the question, question that I would have is, what, what's so special about it? Why, why would There's DNA a little bit of a time delay between this guy on Skype, so in you'll see that. And, and that's why it's a little uncomfortable at times. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of important aspects of DNA from a chemistry perspective. And I think one of the things that uh, strikes me about the chemical structure of DNA is how flexible it is chemically to allow all sorts of code and arrangement of its structure, what we call the, the basis of it, um, to allow a wide variety, almost an infinite number of chemical combinations. So when you, so talk, about, when you talk, talk about the bases, you're talking about the A, T's, G's, and C's, that, and, and, and they can be arranged in any sequence. Yeah. I stuck this in here so you could see. That's kind of how the DNA structure is put together in the simplest form. That's form. correct. And that actually, you would think would be something obvious to every chemist, but even as a PhD chemist, I, I'm looking at the, the structure of DNA for you know, many years. It wasn't until I was reading a book by Stephen Meyer, uh, Signature in the Cell, and pondering the structure once again that it struck me that there isn't anything about the chemistry that is driving the arrangement of the letters. Do you uh, hear that? The basis there, the A, the T, and the G, and the C, that is completely chemically neutral. So this allows essentially any combination that you need. So let's say you have, have, a, 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 so let's say you have a T in the sequence. Anything could come after it. It's, it there's, there's nothing chemically that says uh, an A must come immediately after a T or, or something like that. There are actually no rules in the sequencing of it. That's correct. It, it's so much like, um, well, there's a number of analogies that really work here, but it, you know, it seems like, well, maybe we're missing something about the chemistry that maybe is driving the arrangement of the ladders there. And actually, it was Stephen Meyer, and I really like his analogy. He actually likened it to, here's my really bad magnetic board, really with bad. some ladders on it, that the <laughs> DNA structure itself chemically just allows any arrangement of letters, the A, the T, and the G and C. Now, we know the A and T must match together and the G and the C must match with each other across the strand, but in any order of the rungs of this ladder, they can come in any arrangement. So there isn't a chemical property that is driving that arrangement. It has to come from another source. There has to be a source huh. of information that is driving what we see in the code. I find that utterly amazing. There's nothing in the structure the, they call it the sugar and the phosphate backbone of the DNA. Nothing there is driving the structure. And the base pairs themselves, there's nothing there that's driving the chemistry. If it did, this was the thought that struck me, if there was something chemically driving it, we would see patterns there. We would see, you know, so many T's and then an A, so many G's followed by a T. There's no patterns. It is completely random to our eyes. Well, I guess that if, if there were patterns there, then you actually wouldn't be able to code very much information into it. I mean, if, if, the, if, if the letters of the alphabet had to be arranged in just one specific order every time, we wouldn't be able to spell millions of different words with it. And uh, so here we're basically dealing with an alphabet, a relatively simple alphabet with only four letters, A, T, G, and C, and yet we can come up with, for all practical purposes, 
infinitely different sequences to code different things in the gene. Oh. Two PhDs. These guys are believers, but you're going to hear from four over the years, right up until just a few months ago, that have written deep scientific papers that are on the NIH, National Institute of Health site, that all say the same thing. They say that the DNA coding is highly non-random. In other words, there's a, there's a, there's, there's a focus, there's a communication, there's a language that's being created within the DNA. Both of these scientists say there's nothing in the chemicals or the DNA structure that can create that language. The instructions for the creation of that language are coming from outside the molecule. And they say, we don't know where it's coming from. And we're the stupid ones. We don't know where it's coming from. It's not happening in the, in the chemicals. There's nothing there that's talking and saying, now do this and do this, put this and spell this word and spell this instruction so we can make a carl. Bless God's heart. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. It's just working. It's creating sentences. One complete strand of DNA. I'll show you how small but how large it is. If we could take that double helix out and stretch it from end to end, in one cell, that strand of DNA is six feet tall. In one cell, you have 3.7 trillion, or excuse me, 37 trillion cells. That's how teeny, teeny, teeny this stuff is. How can something that small, this just chemical compounds, Form languages with four letters that create everything you see and everything you don't see that is living. It's the code of life. Where does that come from? Look at this next little clip. This is very short, but it's very important. Obviously, if you have a bunch of information that's encoded in something that's really delicate and can fall to pieces, that information isn't going to last very well. But I'm assuming that DNA is a fairly stable molecule that it can last for a reasonable period of time. It doesn't, it doesn't just keep falling to pieces inside our cells. It must be quite robust. It, it's, it's a fairly robust uh, molecule, so that's good. Now, that keeps it from changing uh, spontaneously, so that's helpful. So in order to work with the code that's there, you, you need helper molecules, enzymes that come in and read it and split it apart because at our body temperature and pH, the DNA molecule will want to stay together. Okay, so, so this, this, this would be when you want to read the information off it, then it will make a copy of it. It has to, that, that double helix has to be opened up. That's right. You have to have a can opener. You have to have a, a little machine that can go through and open it at, at our body temperatures. If you heat it, I believe it's to about 90 degrees Celsius, it will unravel on its own. That's quite a high temperature, and we would die before then. That's almost a boiling water temperatures. So at that high temperature, it will fall apart. But at lower temperatures that our body's at, 37 degrees Celsius or 98 degrees Fahrenheit, the DNA molecule wants to stay together. And so you need a machine to pull it apart so you can read the individual bases that are there. Beautiful. Beautiful. Holy. Divine. Unbelievable. You need little machines. This next clip 
is going to blow your mind. About a year ago, I preached a message on the signature of God inside of our DNA. There's several chapters in my latest book, The Yeshua Protocol, out of about a dozen different astounding revelations in that book. That's one of them. And, and I, I reproduce all of that preaching and teaching in the video of the professor that discovered it. And I reproduce the transcript of his video presentation of it in that book. So if any of you want to see that, and that sermon was preached a year ago, the archives of it are still on the internet. You can get to it by going to my website. And in that presentation, I showed you a brief little clip of these biological machines that can open, can opener, like a can opener, they can open the double helix. And then there are other little machines that come in. You say, what have machines in our body? That's what we call them. They're chemical globules, but they have specific shapes and specific responsibilities, and they know what they're doing. Some machines will come in and split the DNA open. Other machines come behind it and begin to read the two strands, the backbones. Another machine comes in and copies that. Another machine comes in and transports it to the cell. Another machine then helps in the duplication along with tens of thousands of other machines that show up. This happens billions of times a day in your body. I want you to watch this, and I got to tell you right, he's going to say this, but I got to tell you up front, because otherwise you're just going to dismiss it and say, that's science fiction. What you're going to see is computer animated presentation of what scientists are actually seeing. And the globules that are represented, that's how they look in reality. There's going to be a couple of them that you're going to see. You're going to say, no, no, that can't be. And then you're going to hear him say, no, that's exactly how they look and how they work. And the question is, where the heck did that come from? Billions of times a day in trillions of cells for all of our lives. Reading, coding, splitting, copying, reading, coding, splitting, copying. And the instructions change from time to time as we age. And as cells are destroyed, And these scientists all say, we don't have a clue how it knows. It just knows. Play this next clip. It's the longest. It's about four and a half minutes, but it'll blow you away. Pay good, close attention to this. These are tiny molecular machines, and they're doing this inside your body right now. Do you understand why we have to zoom out? Every day in an adult human body, 50 to 70 billion of your cells die. Either they're stressed or damaged or just old. But this is normal. In fact, it's called programmed cell death. But to make up for all these lost cells, right now, billions of your cells are dividing, essentially creating new cells. And that process of cell division, also called mitosis, well, it requires an army of tiny molecular machines. So let's take a closer look. DNA is a good place to start, the double helix molecule we always talk about. This is a scientifically accurate depiction of DNA created by Drew Barry at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research. If you unwind the two strands, you can see that each has a sugar phosphate backbone connected to the sequence of nucleic acid base pairs, known by the letters A, T, G, and C. Now the strands run in opposite directions, which is important when you go to copy DNA. Copying DNA is one of the first steps in cell division. Here, the two strands of DNA are being unwound and separated by the tiny blue molecular machine called helicase. Helicase literally spins as fast as a jet engine. The strand of DNA on the right has its complementary strand assembled continuously, but the other strand is more complicated because it runs in the opposite direction. So it must be looped out with its complementary strand assembled in reverse, section by section. At the end of this process, you have two identical DNA molecules, each one a few centimeters long, but just a couple nanometers wide. So to prevent the DNA from becoming a tangled mess, it is wrapped around proteins called histones, forming a nucleosome. These nucleosomes are bundled together into a fiber known as chromatin, which is further looped and coiled to form a chromosome. 
one of the largest molecular structures in your body. You can actually see chromosomes under a microscope in dividing cells. Only then do they take on their characteristic shape. Otherwise, the DNA is more strewn inside the nucleus. The process of dividing a cell takes around an hour in mammals, so this footage is from a time lapse. You can see how the chromosomes line up on the equator of the cell. Now when everything is right, they are pulled apart into the two new daughter cells, each one containing an identical copy of DNA. Now, as simple as this looks, the process is incredibly complicated and requires even more fascinating molecular machines to accomplish it. So let's look at a single chromosome. One chromosome consists of two sausage-shaped chromatids containing the identical copies of DNA made earlier. Each chromatid is attached to microtubule fibers, which guide and help align them in the correct position. The microtubules are connected to the chromatid at the kinetochore, here colored red. The kinetochore consists of hundreds of different proteins working together to achieve multiple objectives. In fact, it's one of the most sophisticated molecular mechanisms inside your body. Working together. The kinetochore is central to, to the successful separation objectives. of the chromatids. It creates a dynamic connection between the chromosome and the microtubules. For a reason no one's yet been able to figure out, no the microtubules are out. constantly being built at one end and deconstructed at the other. While the chromosome is still getting ready, the kinetochore sends out a chemical stop signal to the rest of the cell, shown here by the red molecules, basically saying this chromosome is not yet ready to divide. The kinetochore also mechanically senses tension. When the tension is just right and the position and attachment are correct, all the proteins get ready, shown here by turning green. At this point, the stop signal broadcasting system is not switched off. Instead, it is literally carried away from the kinetochore down the microtubules by a dynein motor. That's the walking guy. This is really what it looks like. It has long legs so it can avoid obstacles and step over the kinesins, molecular motors that walk in the opposite direction. So Personally, I'm over. astounded by these tiny molecular machines, how they're able to routinely and faithfully execute their functions billions of times over inside your body at this exact instant. I'm speechless. <clears throat> when you add what you've already heard, these chemists and microbiologists say, and we don't know how any of that actually works. Oh, we, we see it. We can describe it. We can, we can reproduce videos of what we're seeing. And we can tell you pretty much what they're doing. They're still discovering what different things do. Tens of thousands of seemingly, and I don't know if I'm using the correct language, but seemingly living, th thinking things that are going up and down the strands of our DNA billions of times a day in all of our cells, replicating, copying, transmitting information, that's messenger RNA that's produced. Tens of thousands of these, let's just call them robots for the, you know, whatever, machines, they call them machines, machines, molecular machines that know exactly what to do. For each living thing, it's different for a blade of grass than it is for me. So they have to do something totally different, but they know what to do. I, I don't even know how to put into words what I want to say. I, we don't know what we don't know. Um, oh, I know some chemists and, and, and evolutionists and uh, microbiologists would be laughing at me. I don't mind, though, because when you read what they write to explain it, it's hilarious. I will give you some examples in a moment. They don't know either. But they're mad. Because the more technology increases and the more we can see and the deeper we can see, 
we know a lot more, but we understand a lot less. Does that make sense? We know a lot more. We can describe it. We can make videos of it. And all this technology. See, the Human Genome Project started in 1990. It wasn't completed until 2003. 13 years it took to map the human genome to discover what signals and messages were being created. That's why when they finished, the scientists said, it's like a book of life. The evolutionists went out of their minds because it's a book. It's an instruction manual that creates a human or it creates a tree. Trees have DNA. Every living thing has DNA. And all of that's going on inside of every living thing. That, see, this is why you're going to see the next little video clip, and this is the last one, then I'm going to close this. But the next one, one scientist asked the other one, so then is it possible to like take DNA and create life? Since we know that's the book of life, can we just take some strands of DNA and just create life? You're going to hear the answer. Um, but at the end of the Human Genome Project, 2003, this is 2023. So 20 years ago, that's, it's new technology. If you remember years ago, decades ago, I, and, and I'm not so vain to think you'll remember me saying this, but I've said it so many times and it's in my books and I've got it referenced, you, you, you'll know this truth. I've stood in the pulpit long before any of this was discovered and the scientists out there uh, on the rudimentary beginnings of the internet were talking about how there's junk DNA. Y'all remember that? Junk DNA. As it turns out, that was only stuff about DNA that they didn't understand. See, how, this is how ridiculous these guys are trying to tell us. It's settled science. <laughs> Not only is this settled science, you don't even know. Once you discover something else, you don't know how it works. So you call it junk. Then you find out later, not only is it not junk, but what they discovered, and I read it to you from this pulpit. I started preaching it over there in the old sanctuary. But when finally we got all the libraries of the world online, and I started doing some research, and then I came across an article out of Harvard Bio... Uh, the, the microbiology, excuse me, I've got so much stuff up here. In microbiology, some people say I have nothing up here. But in, in the Harvard Department of Microbiology, just a few years ago, they published a report, less than 10 years ago, five or six years ago probably, they published a report saying, we now know what the junk DNA is. It's a series of switches that turn information off and on created by the ATCG that helps each molecule and each organism survive by telling it what it is and what to do. I would say that's not junk. I read that report to you right out of the Harvard Biology report not too long ago, some years ago, right here. So with all of this in mind, look at this last brief clip, then I'll pull it all together and take you to the Word of God and wrap it up with what God put on my heart to wrap it up with. Go ahead and play this next clip, if you would. What, what would be the possibility, then, of if you're wanting to, to make life using just, you know, just starting with simple chemicals or something, would it be possible to start with something like just DNA and, and work your way up to all of these other protein machines that we also know are necessary for life today? Yeah, this is a this is a great question, and what uh, a lot more chemists are getting involved with because it's an enigma. We we can't see a real uh, clear way chemically to create uh, life from some of these few simple molecules. And so there there was the original theory that uh, that somehow these DNA uh, molecules or you know parts of it were able to come together. But honestly, that, that theory was discovered pretty quickly and replaced with, well, we need proteins because you need uh, the, the tools, which we call proteins and enzymes, to make DNA. So, but the funny thing is DNA is needed to make the proteins, but you need the proteins to make the DNA. So which one of these chickens and eggs comes first? 
And so those both have been discarded chemically because they, they, you need both of them at the same time. And so this hybrid theory of, well, maybe it's uh, ribonucleic acids, the RNA somehow is able to be one of the first molecules that was spontaneously made. And, and honestly, I think that's pretty much a dead end uh, because we know that even in the simplest living organism, you need thousands of chemicals together. It's not just DNA. Sure, you need the code, that's important, but you need the proteins, you need the chemical environment to all be there. The machines. Just to even have the simplest life. So what is There's like three or 4,000 chemicals, unique chemicals, in the simplest of organisms, and they all have to come together at the same time. What does this tell you about the creator's design of the body? There's a delay here. Uh, could you repeat the question, sir? What does this tell you about the creator's design of the human being? Well, and every other living thing. That's that's right. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, first of all, he's an amazing chemist, so my hat's off to uh, our, our creator. Because when you actually go into the lab and actually try to make these molecules or things like it or even simpler things, you realize all of the problems that can occur. All the side reactions, not having pure starting materials, or having impure reactions that can take place, and things that can get in the way and go down different tracks. We're not, we're not seeing that this chemistry can just happen spontaneously and easily. So it really, so really actually, so many yeah. factors. It, takes, it takes a master chemist to make these master chemicals. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's what we're seeing now is that the more we learn, the more we know how many factors had to be accounted for just to even make life happen and well, to sustain it. Well, not well, to just get it started, but to sustain it. Not to just get it started, but to sustain it. The more we discover, the more we know it's impossible. It shouldn't happen, which is why in all of their wisdom and all that we know in creating computer generated uh, videos of what they're seeing and now everything we know, which is why not a single chemist on the planet out of 8 billion people has ever taken a strand of DNA and created a, a gnat or an ant. Because it's not just taking the DNA and figuring out the code. Now you've got to create all the little robots that tend to it and keep it talking to its, each other and keep creating the proteins that make life and make that ant an ant and not a fish. And all of that information is coming from outside the DNA. And we don't know where. I'm quoting them. Let me preach this. I'm kidding. No, I love it that you're interactive. I'm just messing with you. Keep going. Keep going. You're right. You're right. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. But we're called the stupid ones. Okay, now I'm going to do this very quickly. This won't take long, but this will help you to see that this is not just some Christian pastor with some Christian chemists and biologists in interjecting our bias upon this. Everything those two PhDs said when he's, they said we, 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 they're talking about their colleagues as well. And when they say we don't know, they don't. None of them do. Let me give you four examples. The first paper started, I've got it, was in 1998. Remember, this is before the Human Genome Project was, was finished. Remember, that started in 1990, finished in 2003. All right, all of these papers, I'm going to give you the titles and the first sentence of them, first couple of sentences. And then all of these are found on the National Institute of Health website. They're found at the National Library of Medicine at the National Center for Biotechnology Information. They're deep, deep scientific papers. <clears throat> 1998, written by Dr. Freeland and Dr. Hurst. Title, The Genetic Code is One in a Million. That's the evolutionary scientific way of embarrassingly saying is pretty much impossible, but it's there. 
The genetic code is one in a million. This is before they completed the human genome project where the scientists went, oh, it's like a book of life. It's like an instruction manual. And it's about that thick. And it works. So before they came out and basically said that, we have this paper in 1998. Here's the first sentence. Statistical and biochemical studies of the genetic code have found evidence of non-random patterns in the distribution of codon assignments. A codon is a piece. It's like if you have a sentence, a codon would be like a word. Okay? And it's much deeper than that, but I don't want to bore you with all the, all the scientific jargon. But basically, when, it's, when you hear the word codon, it's talking about the language that's developed by the DNA from an outside source that makes us who we are. Let me see. Now, now with the, the, understanding that word, listen to this again. Statistical and biochemical studies of the genetic code, that's that language within our DNA that tells us who we are, have found evidence of non-random patterns in the distribution of codon assignments. It has, for example, been shown that the code minimizes the effects of mutation and mistranslation. In other words, if it's non-random, that means something's driving this. If there's patterns that are being developed by this non-randomness that gives me my shape and form and my life and my brain function and my organ functions, and we don't know where that information is coming from, we know how it's being created inside my body, but how do those little globules know what to do and to make me different from you. And in 1998, before the Human Genome Project was completed, he, he said, this is non-random. And there are patterns here. This is an intelligent code, and it's coming from somewhere. That's what he said. And he says it's so intelligent that it is very robust. Do you know what the half-life of, and, and I'm not talking down, but if somebody doesn't know what half-life is, I'll explain that in a minute too. The half-life of DNA, 521 years. So if it's in a fairly robust environment, I mean, if you burn it up, you can get rid of it, or if you freeze it below, below way, below freezing, and leave it that way, you could get rid of it. But, but in a normal environment, even with its great extremes, a strand of DNA, even though the host is separated from it, in other words, a dead person or a dead animal, it could last up to 521 years before it begins to break down. Now, the half-life means 521 years later, like 1,000 years, then it's broken in half again of what it was. Then 521 years later, that little piece that's left is broken in half again. Then 520, but thousands of years, parts of the structure of the DNA, a half a millennium, the DNA is intact. <laughs> I'd say that's pretty robust. And that's what this guy's saying. He's saying this is non-random, and it is creating robustness that is unexplainable. That was in 1998, before the Human Genome Project. All right, let's jump up a few years. Let's go to 2009, that's six years after the Human Genome. Dr. Kunin and Dr. Novozihalov, and if you're saying, did you pronounce that correctly? Well, if you don't know, then, then yes, I did. National Institute of Health, National Library of Medicine, 2009, six years after the human genome. Here's the title. Origin and Evolution of the Genetic Code, colon, the Universal Enigma. This is from National Institute of Health. You, again, not talking down to anybody, but a younger person, the word enigma, if I could pronounce it means it's a deep mystery, unexplainable so far. It's an enigma. It's an enigma why you guys would let me be your pastor, for example. See, see what I mean? Okay, but watch this. Origin and evolution of the genetic code. It's a universal enigma. First sentence. 
The genetic code is nearly universal. And the reason they only use the word nearly is because at microscopic life, there are some where the genetic code takes on different chemicals, but very small percentage. But it still works the very same way. That's, that's why it says almost universal. But it is like 99% universal. And the arrangement of the codons in the standard codon table is highly, this is 2009, non-random. 2017, eight years after that 2009 one, the same two authors, Kunin and Novozehelov. 2017, the origin and evolution of the universal genetic code. Now you're thinking, okay, we're getting somewhere. Well, the standard genetic code is virtually universal among all existing forms of life. Although deviations from the universal code exist, particularly in microscopic organisms, I just said that, with small, small genomes, but they are limited in scope and obviously secondary. So the rest of it, the whole rest of the universe is filled with this genetic code that's universal. The universe, universality of the code likely results from the combination of a frozen accident. <laughs> you, do you see? They're grabbing at straws. We're the stupid ones though. Probably a frozen accident. He says, however, the standard genetic code is non-random and ensures high robustness of the code to mutational and translation errors. Yeah, but a frozen accident created that. Oh, my gosh. All right, the last one. This one comes on the NIH site. I hope y'all are enjoying this sermon. This took me like 85 months to put together. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding, not fish. I'm just saying this stuff goes deep, but I'm just trying to put it away. We can get it on a Sunday morning. April 2022, just a few months back. Listen to the title. This is from Dr. Calderaro and Dr. Giglio. Uh, that's, he sounds Italian, and the other guy does too, probably. But I don't, I don't know. It doesn't say where they're from. Uh, April 2022. Here's the title. This is what happens, by the way, when you run into a mess that you can't explain, you throw a word salad at it. The this is the title. The genetic code is very close to a global optimum in a model of its origin, taking into account both the partition energy of amino acids and their biosynthetic relationships. That's the title. Listen, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, not even close to the smartest guy in the world. But I've got a little bit of sense. I have read this and read this and read this. I still don't understand it. <laughs> I mean, that's just me. Somebody here might have heard it and said, I know exactly what it's talking about. Well, good for you. <laughs> Praise God for you. But, all right, I'm going to read the title again. Then I'm going to read the first, uh, the, the conclusion. I, I, I read the whole report and, oh, and my gosh, it's a brain twister. But the conclusion... I thought was very telling. Here's the title again. The genetic code is very close to a global optimum and a model of its origin, taking into account both the partition energy of amino acids and their biosynthetic relationships. Conclusion, quote, therefore, this is his conclusion, we will discuss our observations within the theories proposed to explain the origin of the organization of the genetic code. So if you read the article as I did, he has a multitude of theories that he proposed how all this could happen. Where's this language coming from? So he proposes, you know, evolution, of course, and all the different theories, but he debunks every one of them. I mean, in, in the conclusion, it basically says that because he says, so therefore, the best theory seems to be, wait till you hear what he says, but... I, 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 I'm, I'm just telling you, this was just a few months ago. So he says, therefore, we will discuss our observation within the multitude of all those theories proposed to explain the origin of the organization of the genetic code. In other words, they still don't know. And he does all that. And, and he says, we reach the conclusion 
that the co-evolution theory is the most strongly cooperated theory of how it's communicating. Now follow me. I know some of you are thinking, well, I don't know what the co-evolution theory is. Well, I didn't either until I looked it up. I didn't know that was the title for it, but once I looked it up, I said, oh, I know exactly what he's talking about, and you will too. Co-evolution theory. First proposed by Charles Darwin. So we've come to the human genome, we've come to producing all of this, we've come to all of this, and he goes all the way back to the 1800s when they were still riding horses. And says, that seems to be the best one. Listen to what, is, what the definition of co-evolution. First proposed by Charles Darwin, that certain groups of evolution influenced the evolution of other groups. In other words, the chicken needed to make an egg, so the egg made another chicken. That's co-evolution. But you heard the first physicist up, up here say when he was asking you, he says, no, 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 it's way more complex than that. See, Darwin knew nothing about what you saw this morning. Nothing. No thing. Nothing. So this guy, a few months ago, on the National Institute of Health says, the best way to explain how all this works is to go back to Charles Darwin's nothing. This piece needed this piece, so it needed this piece, but that piece needed this piece, so it gathered this piece, that piece. Who was doing the thinking to tell what, what needed who, and where, and when, and why? It's gobbledygook. It's garbage science. It's what I call welfare science. It's funded by governments. That's modern science. Young people, you are being lied to. Now, there's a lot of good science in this. I mean, look at those videos. Look what we now know. I'm talking about the understanding. See, they have built their lives, this whole world system. You, do you wonder now why nobody knows what a marriage is anymore? Nobody knows what a gender is. Nobody knows what a little girl and little boy is. Nobody knows what a man is. Nobody knows what a woman is. Nobody knows what's inside a human womb. And, you know, a turtle egg is sacred on the beach, but a baby in a womb, we can kill it. And yeah, but We've gone out of our minds. Why? Because a hundred and something years ago, we decided as a nation and as a world that the answer to all of life was co-evolution, a frozen accident of a chemical sludge pond that accidentally, randomly exploded. And here everything is. Yet all of the studies right up to 2022, they keep saying this is non-random. This is not random. But you know, evolution and Charles Darwin, they had their... Do you see the circular reasoning and the looping and the stupidity and the ignorance? Romans 1 talks about this day we're living in. And it talks about how because they denied the creator of all things, and rather than worship him, they worshiped images of birds and animals and humans. That's in all of our textbooks. God gave them over to a depraved mind. And men had relationships with men and women with women. And hatred and murdering and lying and thieving multiplied and people gave honor to those things. And so the whole world was plunged into a delusional state of a depravity of mind. You think we might be there? I gave you pure science this morning, and I know some of you are bored to death, and I'm sorry, but listen, but it comes right out of God's Word. This is the latest we know from our science, and you heard with your own ears and saw with your own eyes. We know the driving force behind this. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep, and then God spoke and said, let there be light. And there was light. And then he spoke and said, let there be living things. Fill the airs. 
that filled the air, birds and flying things. Let there be living things that fill the oceans, the seas, and the fish. Go and multiply. Let there be living things that roam the earth. Let there be grass. Let there be trees. Let there be a planet. Let there be, you know, let there be. Let there be a man. Let there be a woman. Fill the earth. Subdue it. And then we go all the way through the scriptures, and this is continually said over and over and over. We get to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The what Word? The Word that said, let there be light. And that Word was with God and was God. And that word, that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Hebrews chapter 1 says, God has spoken to us many times in many ways in the past. Through the prophets of old. But in these last days, he has spoken to us most clearly through his son. Who is the creator of everything. And who is in the exact image of of God himself. Amen. Colossians 1. You just read it. He is the image of the invisible God. He created everything whether you can see it or not see it. And in him all of it holds together. You know what's driving all of this? All of these professors including the two believers. They, they just admitted. They know. But they just admitted and said it doesn't come from within the molecule. There's nothing in there talking. It's just happening. <laughs> and then these little machines come in. done billions of times a day that's not coming from chemicals there's a language being developed and a book of life for whatever it's being worked on and it's happening every day right under our microscopes right under our eyes and our noses where's this coming from it's the word that has become flesh he speaks it he holds it together now listen to me. That's the God we serve. That's Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Hamashiach, creator, creator of everything, the driver of everything, the word that's making flesh become flesh of everything, the word in which everything holds together. Now, please hear me as we walk through this messed up, fallen world, lying to us every day about everything from marriage to gender to who we are to the word of God to evolution to... Admitting out of one side of their mouth, there's nothing non-random about this, and then saying, but it all happened by a frozen random accident. <laughs> We're being lied to. The word of God does not lie. Jesus Christ does not lie. He said, you abide in my word and let my word abide in you. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. Now we know. Give the Lord a hand. Give the Lord a hand. And now we know that what's driving the whole thing. Is God saying, let there be, let Carl's heart beat another second. There it goes, good. Let it beat again. Okay, there it goes. Let it beat again. <laughs> How long is this going to go till I say stop? <laughs> let him breathe again. Let his cells regenerate again. How many times? Billions of times a day. Until when? Till I say stop. It's the word. The word. As we go through life in this crazy, crazy, lying, deceiving truth being thrown to the ground world. Remember what you've seen and heard here today. Remember your life is in his hands. And people ask questions and they're good questions. I'm not talking down to anybody. I've asked some of them myself. Now as a pastor I have to answer them biblically and scientifically if I can. But people ask questions about, oh, but how is God going to do this and how is God going to do that and when we die how is he going to do this and how is he going to do that? And I just say over and over, just trust him. Our heavenly daddy knows what he's doing. And our heavenly daddy said, in the end, there's no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. Behold, I make all things new. And I will tabernacle with you, and you will tabernacle with me, because you are under the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. So that's where we are. So you learn a lot of scientific stuff. And listen, I'm a science geek. I'm not good at it, and I'm not a chemistry PhD, but I'm a science geek. I love this stuff. And I bow to the discoveries that men and women, they just immerse their lives and they see stuff. What breaks my heart is when they see this and they know the communication is not coming from within the cell. They know it's non-random. They know there are patterns. They know there's an alphabet. They know there's a book of instructions for that organism. And then they say, but that happened accidentally. My heart breaks. Good science 
turned into horrible worldview and it caves in on itself. That's why the Word of God itself says, that's why the Word in the flesh, Jesus said, heaven and earth could pass away, but my Word stands forever. Amen. Stand in that Word, that written Word, and in just the Word that comes from the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. Stand in that Word, keep your eyes on Jesus, He's got this. He's the one that's speaking life into your body right at the molecular level. He's the one that commands the troops of ten thousands of little micro, micro uh, chemical uh, uh, machines, they called them, to come and to do everything that needs to be done inside your cells, in the depth of your cells, in the unseen realm that keeps you alive and keeps you moving until he's ready to call you home. He's the one. Now, if he can do all of that, he can do anything else that he desires as you walk with him in a personal relationship. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord Jesus a big old hand. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself for a brand new book from critically acclaimed best-selling author, Pastor Carl Gallup's The Yeshua Protocol, an explosion of divine revelation for our unique generation. Carl Gallup's takes you on a whirlwind tour through the scripture like you've never experienced. Discover the undeniable Yeshua codes buried within the pages of the Old Testament. Learn the inescapable reality that every living cell in creation is encoded with the very name of God. And be shocked when you see what has been secretly lying within the pages of the Bible that allows you to see Yeshua as you've never before fathomed him. The Yeshua Protocol mentions a wide variety of topics such as quantum physics, ancient Hebrew letter meanings, the latest archaeological finds, and Yahweh's name encoded upon our very own DNA. Do you really cover all of these topics in the book, The Yeshua Code? All of those and many more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're living in incredible times. And, and you know, you speak of, for example, internet technology and all that that entails. You know, I describe it as we are looking at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil.